Hey everyone, this is Joe. I'm the Digital Astronomer. You can see I've got a beautiful night out. It is the first day of March 2022, and it got up to almost 70 degrees here where I live in southern Illinois, and tonight is going to be spectacular. I'm going to have clear skies just about all night, uh, great seeing conditions. It looks like this is going to be one of the best nights that I've had in a while, and that's great because I'm working on a project um, uh, imaging the uh, headphone nebula. Now this is a small planetary nebula. I had never actually heard of it before, but I saw on Joe's Astro uh, channel here a couple weeks ago, he was doing it. I'd actually had uh, had come across it in Stellarium and kind of marked it in my head as something I might want to do, but after I saw Joe working on a collaboration, I thought that'd be great. I'm going to go ahead and work on this, and uh, it works perfect for this setup. This is my Celestron 8-inch telescope. And I usually use this for planetary imaging and galaxy imaging. Um, but what I've got on it here is I've got, you probably can't see it, but back here I've got the Star Azonia Night Owl 0 .40 focal reducer. That brings this down to a little over 800 millimeters in focal length. And then I've got the ZWO 533 camera. And this is a great combination uh, for things like planetary nebula. And I'm looking forward to hopefully having a great image. Stick around, we'll take a look at it. I've already cut, uh, gathered about six hours of data on this object. I'm going to gather probably tonight somewhere around another four or five, maybe another six hours. Um, also, I should tell you that I'm using the Optolong L Enhanced Dual um, narrowband filter on this and uh, that gives me some great images i processed a little bit of this data already what i've already collected it's looking great and i hope that this added data is really going to bring out some details so stick around i'll be right back and we'll take a look Okay, before I show you my final picture of this, I want to tell you a little bit about this object. And I want to share with you a little bit of why I think why I think that this is often goes as a neglected object in the night sky. If you're like me, I had never heard of Jones Emerson 1 in my entire life. I'd really never seen any pictures of it until just recently. But it is a really good photographic object if you're into astrophotography. Now, I think the reason that we don't see a lot about it is that it's very dim. It comes in at a magnitude of 14. Now, to give you some comparison on that, the, uh, the dimmest or faintest uh, objects that we can see with the naked eye come in at about a magnitude 6.5. Now remember, the magnitude scale goes from the higher the magnet number, the dimmer the object, the lower the number, the brighter the object. And so the dimmest things that we can see in the night sky just with our eyes would come in about a magnitude 6.5. The dimmest object in the Messier catalog is M91, which comes in at a magnitude of 12.3. So in comparison, Jones Emerson 1 is six times fainter than the faintest Messier object and 18 times fainter than the faintest objects that we can see with our naked eye. So this is a really dim object. With, but with that in, said, it's relatively large for planetary nebula and it really photographs nicely. And so if you're an astrophotographer, you really should check out this object. It's a really good object to look at. Now, it was discovered in 1939 by two astronomers, Rebecca um, Jones and Richard Emerson. And they were looking over some plates of the Harvard Observatory and they came across this little smudge. And because it was the first object they had jointly discovered, they called it Jones Emerson 1. Now, recently, back in the 1960s, it was concluded in a catalog of planetary nebula. In 1968, two uh, Czechoslovakian astronomers, Lubos Perik and Lubos Koatek, 
put together a catalog of all of the planetary nebula that had been discovered up to that point of time. And they labeled them with the letters P, K for their last names, and then they gave the galactic co uh, uh, coordinates. And so the, galactic, the, the P, K number for this is P, K 164 plus 31-1. And so that's the, the, the catalog number there. Now, Let's go over to Stellarium, and I want to show you where you find this in the night sky, and then I'll show you a little bit about the processing very quickly. Okay, just to help you find this in the night sky, you can see here that I'm looking sort of towards the north, northeast. Here is the constellation Lynx. Now, um, this object is located in this constellation. Okay, so if I go over here and I simply go to Stellarium and type in Jones Embersom 1. Okay, and I go in and then I begin to zoom in. By the way, you, you links, I can't find it in my night sky it is these stars are just too dim with my light polluted skies to be able to find but i can find ursa major anybody can find the big dipper and if you just sort of follow this up and come down from capella capella is an extremely bright star so when i set this up by the way um i actually did uh my uh star alignment on capella and then i uh, went ahead and um did my focusing and everything on Capella and then uh, swung over or slewed over to this uh, object. Okay, so if I zoom in here, you can kind of um, see it begin to develop here. And you can see it's very faint. But if I zoom in here, here is the Headphones Nebula, Jones Emerson 1. And of course, I've got this set up to show you the imaging um, uh, square here. This is set up for my Celestron uh, C8 with the Night Isle 0 .40 focal reducer and my ZWO 533. So this is what it looks like here. Okay, so what I ended up doing was taking a total of 15 hours worth of imaging. That was 320 uh, subframes. They were three minute long subframes. Um, and then for each night, that was spread over the course of four nights. I'll just show this to you real quick. Um, here are each one of my capture folders. You can see I've got four nights worth of imaging. And then in each folder, I've got my lights, and then I shot flats and dark flats. And then for each night, I produced a master dark flat and a master flat. So each one of these four nights has um, my lights, and then a master dark flat and a master flat. And then I shot 40 um, regular dark frames. And what I ended up doing was putting all of that together in Astro Pixel Processor. And the way I processed this, because I was shooting with the L, uh, uh, L Enhance filter, that's a dual narrow band filter, I separated out my HA and O3 files. And this is what they came out. This is my HA file. And you can see, um, I'm going to have to crop this out to make it square, but um, you can see here over the course of those four nights, this is the, um, the integration of my HA data. This is my O3 data. And then the only things that I did in Astro Pixel Processor is I used the batch crop feature over here to go ahead and crop out the square and, and, and get that. Then I did a light pollution correction just to get out any gradient. Save that as a TIFF file. I do think I did a little bit of a saturation, just increased the saturation a little bit. And then I took that over to Photoshop. And this is the picture that came out of Astro Pixel Processor. Once I did an RGB combine um, and then um, did a little bit of a saturation boost on it, this is the picture that I carried over to Photoshop. From there, I ran a few processes, and I'll just show you these as layers really quickly. Uh, first thing I did was run a, a noise reduction through Topaz. 
this this image did not have a lot of noise in it. You know, 15 hours of integration time, you're, you're going to have a pretty low signal to noise ratio. Things are going to be pretty good in that situation. Plus, with 40 darks, um, I, I took out most of the um, most of the uh, noise. In fact, if I zoom in here, this is pre. This was the picture right before. The, uh, that came out of Astro Pixel Processor. This is with the noise reduction done. So it just took a little bit of that noise out. Then I went ahead and ran two integrations of Make Stars Smaller. Now that is an action set that I have, and I'll show it to you here real quick. This is in the Astronomy Tools 1.6.2 uh, action set. And I ran a couple, uh, two ver uh, iterations of Make Stars Smaller. That uh, just kind of uh, uh, cleaned up maybe a tiny bit of the bloating of the stars. Um, but overall, it looks pretty good. Then I went and ran in that same package an Increase Star Keller. And that brought out a little more of the blues and a little bit more of the oranges uh, down in here. Then I went ahead and ran... Um, I did a sharpening of the, um, the image um, using uh, APFR. I'll just show that to you real quick. This is a little action set by uh, Christopher Caltesis and sharpened up the image a little bit. And you can see that brought out a little bit more of detail down in here. Then I ran some camera raw adjustments where I just simply increased the saturations a little bit. And I think this is where uh, you see the most uh, change. All right, I, I changed down and, and, uh, and darkened the background up just a little bit, uh, increased the saturation, uh, maybe brought up the sharpening just a tad, and really made this nebula kind of pop out. And then finally, I did one more star reduction, and that gave me this, my final image. Now, I will show you something really fascinating about this. Of course, um, if I zoom in here just a little bit, you see this very small, faint, let me try to circle it here for you. See this small star right here that I'm drawing a circle around? That is the white dwarf. Now, it appears blue simply because it's sitting behind all of this oxygen gas, all of that blue gas right here. But that is the star that created this whole nebula. Um, somewhere back in its history, uh, in, in the evolution of that star, it um, is coming to the end of its life. And as they do, as our sun will one of these days, it lost and puffed out, kind of blew out a whole bunch of the gases. And that's what we're seeing out here. Eventually, this will you know, dissipate and disappear, and we won't see this anymore. But it's going to take a long, long time. So that is kind of interesting. That's the white dwarf that the very center of this uh, nebula that has created all of this. The other thing that I'll note, if you see these faint patches here and here, those are actually galaxies back behind this object. In fact, there are a lot of galaxies in this picture. Let me point them out to you very quickly. Okay, so this, this object here is about 1,200 light years away. But if we just come right off here to the side, here's a little spiral galaxy right here. There's a spiral galaxy. Here's another little spiral galaxy right here. Here's one right here. Uh, if I zoom out just a little bit more and move over, you'll see there are some more. There's one right here. That one right there, there's a little spiral galaxy right there. In fact, if you look at this picture for any length of time, you will find multiple, uh, many, many more. And these are millions of light years away. So really what we're seeing here is a rather interesting picture. This is about 1,200 light years away. And then these are millions of light years away, these galaxies. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Overall, I'm really satisfied with this. This is a picture that I'm pretty proud of. Um, it came out really, really beautifully. I think the color is really neat. I love the blue oxygens that popped out of this. And... Um, Again, if you haven't ever imaged the Headphones Nebula, 
or, or Jones Emerson one, get out there and do it. It is a pretty cool image. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this picture. Um, if you did, please subscribe to my chan channel and do me a favor, click on the like button and share it with your friends. And I'll be back next time with some more pictures of the night sky. Just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed this video, please help support me by clicking on thumbs up and share. Thank you.